Our goal is simple, to help you achieve the dream and vision you first had when you thought about starting a business. We're here to make growing your business less complicated. There are building blocks to build a sustainable business. We promise to seek them out and address them all. The Better Your Business Show starts now. Good morning and welcome to the Better Your Business Show. Here we discuss your most important business challenges and provide you with practical solutions to help you better your business. Indeed, if you're an entrepreneur, solopreneur, mom or papapreneur, then you are a goal achiever. You have dreams and aspirations, which you may not have, are experts that can provide you step-by-step uh, road, a step-by-step roadmap to achieve, roadmap to achieve your dreams. You know, when we all started out in business, as well as all of the viewers out here who are listening to us, when we all started out, the one thing we did not get was an instruction manual. You know, when you open that box up, when you get a brand new chair or a table and the instruction manual is there. Now, you can put it together without it, but normally there's a screw left over. But when you're building your business, no one hands you that manual. So there's probably many screws missing, many holes in the business. And so we put this show together and brought the experts so that we can help plug these holes so that you can build a better business. Yes, so whether you are joining us live or watching the replay, make sure you take your free business assessment at pillar5.com and then you can join us live in our virtual studio where we can address your comments and concerns throughout the show. Absolutely. So um, I, I want to do a little something different. Hey, Ron and I have been having little secret conversations, Natalie, uh -huh. and we, we, we've been talking about subjects that we think um, are, are relevant to all business owners. And so we'd like to lead the show off by having some of these little short dialogues before we bring on our expert guests to talk about the topic of the day, to just talk about some of the things that business owners may be thinking right now. Um, and I think one of those lead back to is going to eventually lead back to what we're discussing, but success versus sustainability and, and how business owners use both of those terms synonymously, but they're really not. And so we wanted to just talk a little bit about what is the difference between success versus a sustainable business? Right, right. Well, one of the first things I found out when I was looking at that is that success is subjective. Everybody is has the right to have their own version of what success means to them. If they can have a certain amount of time in the week to themselves, that could be successful. Making a certain amount of money um, annually or monthly, that could be successful. Having been able to pay their bills two months in advance, three months in advance. Some people say a year in advance. Um, just being happy or peaceful, whatever subjectively that means to a person, can all be considered successful. However, sustainable is objective, not, not subjective. It's the state that something is in. It can sustain or self-sustain. So a lot of entrepreneurs are looking after success without trying to look for sustainability. And um, it's like if you look for sustainability, success is almost a byproduct of that. Whereas success is like, I can't tell you what's successful to you. Only you can tell you what's successful to you. So we all have different goals to achieve. And, and um, therefore, that leads to the methods that we're going to choose to reach those goals. Nurjeen, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, it's so, interesting. Uh, go ahead. Very Natalie. interesting like topic because, um, yeah, I mean, it's very true, Tehran. I think you hit it on the head, right? Everyone has a different definition of what success is, but how do we keep ourselves in business long term? And I think that's something that a lot of business owners aren't thinking about, right? We have a pandemic like we're going through now, and all of a sudden people have to shift their mindset as opposed to if this was our mindset in the beginning, we're starting with the end in mind, right? We're already we're preparing for, for challenges like this. Um, so I think that's a really great point because a lot of people are not focusing on the long term. They're just focusing on working, 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 and then it's okay, what's my end game? All of a sudden I'm not I can't work anymore, I'm burnt out or I'm sick or whatever happens, right? Then it's I gotta figure out that end game as opposed to preparing with the end of mind and having a sustainable business. Yeah, man. Absolutely. And I was especially thinking, especially since Sharon 
um, lecture when she was on, she was talking about building a scalable and sellable business, having an exit strategy. COVID came through and knocked people, knocked the wind out of people. But also some people weren't affected by COVID. Some industries weren't, their businesses thrived. So it's like, depending on how you structured it, what happens when the rain comes? Always when you think about the three little pigs thing, what happens when the storm comes? Did you build it to be sustainable? And so in spite of what happens, you're kind of on solid ground, you're grounded, you're rooted. Um, and, and unfortunately, not in the entrepreneur world, we don't think about that until something happens. So we wait till the fire comes to try to put it out versus being prepared for fires in case they arrive. You were about to say something, Carl? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to weigh in that when, when I talk with entrepreneurs and business experts, I, I think the difference that I see in their understanding of success versus sustainability is they're on a different trajectory. They're on a different path. They have a different mindset. The, the person who is successful is seeking the end result as fast as possible. You know, they want to generate the revenue as fast as possible. They want to get to the end. You know, they may be looking for a venture capitalist not to grow and scale their business, but they're technically looking for a venture capitalist so that they can get money so that they can stick it in their pocket and go, I got money, right? So their mindset's a little bit different. They're chasing a success and not the process. Where when I talk with people who understand sustainability, they're interested in processes, they're interested in scalability, they want to grow their business to another level. Um, and they're also interested in building a team where the person with success is typically trying to do it themselves. It reminds me about the guy who sells mixtapes out of his trunk, right? He's not looking for a sustainable way. He's looking to make a dollar for the night, right? So he can do whatever he's trying to do. Where someone else that that may be selling the very same mixtape out of their trunk has 15 people selling tapes out of the trunk and they all work underneath him so he's looking to build a sustainable scalable business he can go on vacation and still generate revenue and so, yeah, so those, i think <laughs> to me that's the mindset that right. that's where the mindset differs and i know and i can't wait to get our expert and i'm not even going to reveal his name because he's such a powerhouse i want to leave that to natalie to bring that wow. in I'm about to what you do. You just lost, I'm sure, so many millennials. Like, what is he talking about? A tape? <laughs> oh, that's like hysterical. Said, I'm really, I'm really excited about today. <laughs> Real to die, excited about today's uh, expert guest we have on today. Um, today we have Mo Rock that's going to help us out. And he's going to really help us take a deep dive in, for instance, subjects like this and having an objective person that can hold your feet to the fire to have you thinking about certain things you might not be thinking about I in mean, today's topic. What is today's topic, by the way, Natalie? So today we're going to be talking about boardroom benefits, why small businesses should have an advisory board. Why is that important in business? So yes, very excited to have Mo on this morning. Uh, can we just go ahead and bring him in? Is he here with us? We're going to bring him in. Publisher, Excellent. LA Tribune. He's a author, thought leader. I mean, just can't say enough about him. If anyone you've met Mo, familiar with Mo, he has a heart to serve. And I'll tell you, one of my most favorite things about him is he's not afraid to stand for what he believes in. And if you've watched anything with the LA Tribune, you know he's not afraid to stir the pot. He's not afraid to get controversial. He's just about having us know the facts, right? And so I really appreciate that about <laughs> him. So, Mo Thank Rock, Mo welcome to the Rock. show. Thank you guys. Welcome, Thank welcome, you. Mo. I appreciate you guys. And I love that uh, mixtape analogy. It reminds me of when Curtis Jackson built his empire in the early 2000s, Carlton. He had many people selling his mixtapes. And look, what you know, he ended up going from that to at, at, at his peak, having a net worth of about 300 million with the deal he did with vitamin water. So when you're talking about mindset, that mixtape mindset is what led to a $300 million net worth, right? Mm -hmm. And so I absolutely love that metaphor. And you're, you're only going to get metaphors like that on this show, on this TV network. So be sure to um, always come back and watch this show because I love I love the work that you guys are doing. It's an honor for us to be able to work hand in hand with you guys on your collective mission of transforming the world by transforming businesses and transforming businesses by transforming the way that leaders look at their business. And what's incredible about the work of Tehran and Carlton and Natalie and everyone else at I Do Systems is they are able to actually transform the way people look at their business, uh, enhance the level of awareness that a person has. How can you fix something when you're not even aware of the problem? 
Or if there's not a problem, how can you increase your uh, opportunity costs if you don't even know what the opportunity costs are? So you see, you, you guys haven't even asked me a question yet and you already got me pumped up. You see how, how talented <laughs> you guys are? <laughs> Mo, I gotta say, I was a little nervous when you said you were gonna go get coffee because I know yeah. how high strung you are. So I was just like, Wait that's right. Let's do it. Let's have some fun. <laughs> So, Mo, let's jump right into it. Uh, um, and I know some people that are watching this may not know, you know, that you're an amazing publisher and the CEO of the Los Angeles Tribune. I, I want to just dive into this a little bit. You also have been an investor. What is your experience from the investment side for companies that come to you and go, Mo, Mo, please throw me a quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars. I need to build my business. What's one of the things that are important to you when you're looking at those businesses? And, and typically you find that they're missing. So it, we've all heard it all before, right? There's nothing you haven't heard before, but I, I look at the person first. In other words, if I look at the last 10 years of your, your life and you've had three different startups, it's highly unlikely that I'm going to be interested in working with you. Um, on that level. Why? Because uh, a, a unfortunate trend, Carlton, that I've seen and many people have seen is there are folks that they're professional startup artists, meaning every few years they have a new startup. They, they want that first round of funding and usually they don't get to a third or fourth or, or fifth round. They just want that first round. And so sadly, that's become a big epidemic are folks that only care about getting that first round so they have enough juice for two or three years and then on to the next thing. And so, so the first thing is to weed that out. And that is much uh, larger than most individuals, most investors, most consultants, most people in business realize. Mm -hmm. So that is a significantly large percentage of the startups out there. Um, but you've got to have the ability to see through, to recognize those, um, those kind of businesses. So that that's number one is I avoid those, right? Because those are more common than people realize. Mm. And, and uh, th that's usually related to the leadership, right? Which is why I'm really big on leadership, which is why I, my last book was about leadership, which is why most of the things I speak about are on leadership. Because I believe to have a successful business, to have a successful company, you've got to be a successful leader. And that has to do more with mindset than it does with specific techniques, tools, and strategies even. So leadership is really what I wanna, authentic leadership, integrity-based leadership, people that, that can uh, play the long game. I don't wanna ever work with someone that's short-term greedy. I wanna work with people that are long-term greedy, right? Mm -hmm. what, what is your, what, how are you looking in terms of the market five, 10 years from now, you know, when Jeff Bezos was building Amazon, he didn't give a damn about building a book company, but he knew what he was doing. He was building the infrastructure, right? right? For, for most folks, you looked at Amazon in 1996 or 1997, you thought that's a really cute company, right? Right. right. You know, <laughs> that's cute. Jeff Bezos is kind of cute. Oh, look at him. He's so adorable. <laughs> you know, he, he wants to sell books on online. That's cute. Yeah, well, that's what right. they didn't realize was, he was more like a like a genius scientist than, than just a book salesman because he built the infrastructure that afforded him the opportunity to get the warehouses, to build the logistics, to develop his customer service, to develop everything that he needed. So when he flipped the switch and went full retail, he already mm -hmm. had the infrastructure, right? And so right. he was able to quietly build everything out. No one understood what he was doing really for the first 10 years. Right. And then when he finally flipped the switch, they're like, oh, wow. So he's not just a, a, a nerdy book salesman. He's actually one of the smartest people in the history of business. OK, I get it now. And so think long term and, and people that, that have a, a tendency to think long term, you know, it doesn't matter if you're understood with what you're doing now. You've got to have that long term plan, that long term vision. So thinking in terms of the future. OK, operating from a future perspective, not a present perspective, having good leadership qualities and uh, a good track record that does not consist of lots of startups that have come and gone. So, Mo, real quick. Um, so you, you named off those three main highlights. 
how does a board of advisors or a board of directors help uh, uh, um, minimalize the amount of you know companies that are going through two or three or four or five startups in five years? You know, every day is a new idea. I want to do something different and get funding. How would how does board of advisors play into that or board of directors play into that? Well, there's a big distinction between those two. And I Absolutely. recommend most people focus on, especially when they're new in business, the board of advisors. You, you don't need to build a board of directors. That's going to complicate things. Um, when, when someone is dealing with the board of directors, uh, suddenly the interests of that board of directors become compromised in the sense that when you have a board of advisors, you can really look at them more like uh, mentors. You can really uh, utilize them with full transparency. You can speak to them fluidly, transparency. Why? Because there's nothing at stake, right? When you have a board right. of directors, that sense of transparency, sadly, I mean, in the ideal world, this wouldn't be the case, but I'm a pragmatic person, kind of fizzles away. Right. You might have a honeymoon phase with your board of directors. Right. But as, as soon as those checks start rolling in and, and they see the, they see the money coming in, that the honeymoon phase will, will shift very quickly. Whereas with the board of advisors, you don't need to worry about that. And so mm -hmm. I would say don't go after a board of directors and especially don't approach people. Right. Asking them to be on your board of directors because there, there's a lot of liability with that. There's a lot of legal things that come with that, but you can ask them to be on your board of advisors, which people are much more inclined to actually uh, join because it's a very simple, not as formal uh, thing. And having a board of advisors is actually probably one of the most underrated aspects of business, which is why I'm so glad we're talking about the subject matter. Because if you think about it, let's say you have 10 years experience in business and you have four people they each have 25 years experience in business that are on your board of advisors. You've just 10 X your business experience because now you have a mm -hmm. hundred years worth of experience uh, that you have at any given meeting. And so board of advisors is essential part of business and it doesn't have to always be so formal. Um, so I highly recommend uh, if you, if you're in business and you don't have a board of advisors, ask yourself why you really should. And in addition to that aspect of it, Carlton, mm -hmm. if you're able to get individuals that have a level of uh, esteem to their name, individuals that have are, you know, been very well accomplished, have some stature, that also increases the brand integrity of your company. And mm -hmm. so as an example, you, you, what you'll find if you go through the U.S. representatives is probably 60, 70, 80 percent of them are on boards of advisors all over the place. Go look at your local congressman and, right. and, and call his office and say, hey, I'm curious on how many different companies is, is congressman uh, so-and-so, uh, you know, how many different businesses, companies or nonprofits is he on a board of advisory for? The guy won't even be able to tell you the name of names of all the companies he's on. He'll have to ask wow. his assistant to pull a list because it's a very common thing because it's also mutually beneficial, especially if you have a business that's cause orientated. Right. So if you have a business that's cause orientated and you're very uh, public about what that cause is, it's also going to be much easier for you to get someone of a higher stature to be on your board of advisors, which therefore increases the, the credibility of your company, which therefore increases the likelihood of getting investors and clients. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Hey, Guys, what, you want to ask? I'm going to ask you, all, Mo. So, when a person is looking to add advice, an advisory board or have advisors, right? So, what should a person look for? Is it just experience, or not? Not even what should they look for? What should be red flags? Because sometimes we like people that aren't really a best fit for what the mission is, but they have the notoriety. They're very popular. They may be our subjective versions of successful, so we want them on our advisory board, and they may not really be good for it. So, are there any things that entrepreneurs should question when vetting people for their advice to be on their advisory board. Other Absolutely. Than just that's a great Absolutely. question. It is a great question. And, and that's part of the reason why it's important for folks to be careful about the board of directors, but you can be a little more lenient with the board of advisors. Right. And so what you don't want is you don't want to have someone on your board of advisors that obviously has 
an interest in another similar kind of company that could be perceived as a competitor. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't, you don't want to have someone involved in what you're doing that might, you know, not have the greatest uh, history themselves, whether that's, you know, if they had issues with, you know, a, a previous company, if they have things that uh, would be questionable regarding their background. So, you know, but the good thing is Tehran, quite quite candidly, a board of advisors, you can give people a chance and, and take that chance uh, with a little more confidence than you can with the board of directors, right? So if you if you give someone a chance to be on your board of advisors and it doesn't work out, it's not as much of a difficult process to have that relationship uh, part ways peacefully. Whereas if right. they're on your board of directors, it becomes very complicated. You've got to get a lot of lawyers involved, you know, this and that. And so with board of advisors, you can kind of, you know, look at a more without as much of a formal perspective on it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because I'm, I'm of the uh, opinion, I guess I could say, that life is an interview. I think whether we know it consciously or not, every time you meet somebody, they're interviewing you to figure out who you are. and You're interviewing them to see which category you already subjectively and subconsciously have. Oh, this person's like that or that person's like that. So life is really an interview. Everybody's interviewing everybody. I think it was Cat Williams who said, people meet your PR first. They don't even really meet you. They meet your public representative. <laughs> so just being proactive and doing that for a board of advisors even, that makes a lot of sense. It's like, okay, is this person really a good fit? Let me talk to them as if they are on my board already to see how that really feels. So I can get the honest, honest, you know, true, true, um, representation of who or what they represent. You know, Absolutely. Cat Williams, you know, between Cat Williams, you know, the mixtapes, I think we have a lot of good, you know, <laughs> the, the, the show. <laughs> it's got a lot of, got a lot of good metaphors yeah. here. You know, I brought up, I brought up Curtis Jackson. Someone else brought up Cat Williams, you know, the entertainment industry has a lot of great metaphors for business. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Mo, let me ask one thing. First of all, for our audience, you're watching the Better Your Business show uh, with Natalie Esman, Tehran Glover, and our guest expert, who's CEO and publisher uh, for the Los Angeles Tribune, Mo Rock, is in the house with us today. Um, and we're talking about boardroom benefits and why advisory boards are uh, a must have inside of your small business, no matter what your business size is. So, Mo, and I was just going to lead into that. I was going to ask you, how soon? when a person comes up with the aha moment and go, I want to build a business, I have an idea, how soon should they begin formulating this advisory board? That's a very good question. And, and you know, because if you're getting inspired action, mm. the last thing you wanna do is have that inspired action that, that, that you're getting in your mind, in your heart, heart, in your spirit. You don't want to necessarily have that go through a lot of buffers mm -hmm. right away. What I would say is build the foundation, go out into the trenches, make some noise in the marketplace and show the potential individuals that you want on your board of advisors something tangible. Don't, don't show them an idea, right? For a number of different reasons. One, Taking your thoughts and having them go through buffers is usually not a good idea, especially if it's an inspired thought. You need to create and then show your creation. So that's number one. You, you have the risk of someone saying one thing, maybe with good intentions, that suddenly ruin that inspired action that you have and ruin that momentum mm -hmm. that you have built up internally. And so I wouldn't do it right away. And two, the second reason why I wouldn't necessarily do it right away, I would do it relatively soon after you've built some of the infrastructure, but not as soon as you come up with the idea. And, and number two is when you have something tangible, you have some leverage, you have something you can show, you know, it, it, it's good for someone on your board of advisors to be a mentor, to advise you, to, um, you know, help guide you, but you don't want someone that's constantly reminding you they're doing you a favor, right? right? You want it, you want it to be mutually beneficial. You don't want it. You don't want to call someone and have it feel like he's doing he or she is doing charity work for you. That's not. You, you, we're talking business. We're not talking, you know, philanthropy here. And so have something that that has some some market value that has at the very least some tangible potential outside of your deck, right? Because when I say potential, a lot of entrepreneurs out there are thinking, well, you should see my deck. 
you'll see how much potential I have. I'm not talking about your deck. I'm talking about something <laughs> that's actually <laughs> that's actually in the market right now. Okay, and so right. build the the foundation first, so you have some leverage, and then when you have that leverage, you're actually naturally going to attract a lot of people that want to you know be a part of what you're doing. Going back to the mixtape metaphor, you know, when Curtis Jackson started selling those mixtapes, all of a sudden Young Buck wanted to be part of G Unit. You know, all of a sudden a, a lot of other people wanted to be a part of his movement. You know, he didn't have to just articulate what his vision was. He went out, he did his thing. Next thing you know, Dr. Dre noticed him. Next thing you know, Eminem signed him, right? Because he went into the trenches first and he developed a buzz in the marketplace. He didn't call Dr. Dre before he built that buzz and say, Dr. Dre, can you please be on my advisory board? I have this vision. I want to be the biggest rapper in the world. You know, <laughs> Dr. Dre would have hung up on him. But he went into the market first. He built a buzz and Eminem and Dr. Dre went after him. Right. Mm. Rappers like Young Buck wanted to join the movement. Right. And so you build the hype, you build the momentum. And then the advisors will come with leverage on your part. Right. So, so, so basically build the value, show value, lead with value, right? Show leading with the value. How big is that a component from an investor's perspective? Because you, you do have a background in that as well. So just curious, when you're looking at these decks that people are always pitching at you and these opportunities, is that something that you're looking at? Are you looking to see if they have an advisory board or if they're trying to do this you know, like Superman solo and doing it all by themselves. And uh, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that. You know, the, it, it helps, right, <laughs> to an extent, but the real value is going to be for the actual person because what we'll also find is that there are a lot of stagnant advisory board members, right? Mm. There, there are a lot of companies that maybe their cousin's friends with a celebrity or, you know, they know a public figure or going back to the, the, the congressman example that I shared, so there's a lot of individuals that are on advisory boards that aren't necessarily active members of the day to day or, or you know, in many cases they have a, a quarterly call. So how active are they really in the company? We don't know that as investors. If I'm looking at a deck and you show me uh, a, you know, a series of advisory board members and I see Colin Powell is on there, I don't know how often you talk to Colin Powell. Right. 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 So right. for me, it doesn't make that much of a difference because you could have just been very, you know, maybe maybe you knew someone that knew someone, right? But at the same time, maybe Colin Powell is an you know, a, a big part of your day to day. Maybe your relationship is closer. So I don't know that, right? But you do know that as the business owner. And so the value of the advisory board is more for the business owner and the leadership than it is really for the investor. Yes, it'll make a, a difference. But it's not going to make or break the situation because you can have a company that really doesn't have much value at all and have Colin Powell on your advisory board. And it's highly unlikely anyone will invest just because of that name. Right. right. But if if you're utilizing him as a partner on your journey and utilizing that as a resource for your leadership, you know, as the business owner, how much that impacts you. So really, it, it, it's about making sure that your advisory board actually cares is putting enough time in it for you and that you as the leader can utilize that for yourself. More of an internal thing as opposed to an external thing. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, wow. Good insight. Great insight there. Like what you said earlier about, you know, once you, you know, present it, it's all not just about the deck, I guess you can, you can show people better than you can tell them if you take the time to build the infrastructure to have something to show. Uh, yep. versus being ready to just put something out there to show. Yep. You know, you guys, on one of your Monday Night Lives, which is phenomenal, I suggest everybody watch, catch the. I, I, I tuned in one night, and you had a panel of from SoCal investors telling entrepreneurs what they are looking for in order to invest tens and millions of dollars into their business. I'm like, man, this guy has all kind of people on his Monday Night Live. But one thing that they were talking about, I noticed you mentioned it earlier, was having either something to show or having the idea. Yeah. And when you mentioned uh, with uh, Dr. Dre and Eminem and, uh, and Young Buck, how the action caused the response to that action. But being so committed to the action, the rest is gonna, the, the rest will reveal itself in ways you may not even understand if you're committed mm -hmm. 
to the value of what it is you're going to present or what's going to become presentable anyway as far as getting how many rappers have we met in our lives that have spoken to us about being the next big thing about being the biggest rapper in the world and then how many rappers have we met that maybe didn't become the biggest rapper in the world but they had a song on the radio they had a top 40 hit or they made the billboard charts mm. who gets more respect from from the marketplace the person that talked about being the number one rapper in the world or the person that actually had a, a minor hit. Well, at least that person had a hit. They had something in the market, right? And, and, and you know, you can talk to me about you know your watermelon, or you can talk to me about your pineapple, or you can talk to me about your grapefruit, or you can actually show me your grape. I would rather have you show me your grape <laughs> than talk to me about your big grapefruit, right? right. And so you know, especially in a day and age where being an entrepreneur and being a startup owner has become like a, the new celebrity, right? You, you, it's become like the new rock star, mm -hmm. which is crazy to me because you should not be an entrepreneur if you want to be a rock star, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but because it's become, because of the social media age, it's become a trend. You have a lot of people that just are, are, are in love with the idea of being like a startup owner or an entrepreneur whatever the case may be. Um, sadly, you know, there's a lot of people doing it for the wrong reasons. And this has kind of lowered the, the overall quality of um, startups out there in the market as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just to keep it raw and real, as Natalie said that I, the, so gracefully that I like to keep it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, you're watching the Better Your Business show with Mo Rock, CEO of the Los Angeles Tribune. We're talking about boardroom benefits. Um, we're going to take a quick break or refill your coffee cups. We'll be back in just a minute. Um, and uh, just so you all know that the Better Your Business show is supported in collaboration and sponsored by the Los Angeles Tribune and this amazing gentleman that you see on the screen right now today, Mo Rock. Um, and he's just here bringing a lot of insight into the boardrooms. So if you're running your business and you don't know whether or not you have, need to have an advisor, please tune in, take notes, and listen to what's going on on this show. We'll be back in just a minute. Where did it go? No. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. And we are back. That was super fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that didn't go. Okay, well, we won't go. It doesn't want to so, go. So, we'll so oh, double down <laughs> on how valuable it is to have others outside to help you do what you can do because instead of doing everything that you need to do yourself. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's that's part of delegating. And, and again, going back to leadership, right? You've got to have people that you know, like, and trust, you know, that, that work with you in business. And so I have to know you, I have to like you, and I have to trust you in order for me to delegate aspects of my business to you, awesome. right? If I don't know you, like you, or trust you, and I'm delegating aspects of my business to you uh, and saying, hey, you know what? Run off with it. The biggest compliment I can give anyone that I work with, the biggest compliment I can give anyone that works with me on any of my projects is me not constantly talking with them because that means I trust you, right? And I know it, it frustrates people all the time sometimes because I have a tendency you know, to, um, to get so zoned in in what I'm doing that sometimes I, uh, you know, some other things that, that need my attention may be put on hold, but that's the biggest compliment that I can ever give you. Because if I'm constantly talking to you, that means I don't trust you, mm, right? right? So right. if I'm like, you know what? No, I trust this person. I know that he or she got it. Right. And so finding people that, you know, like and trust and letting those relationships grow and, and giving them the space to be a leader, because a true leader helps instill other leaders. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyone can point their finger and say, do this, do that, do this. That's that, that's not leadership. Right. That's just pointing your finger. <laughs> right. <laughs> there are a lot of people that know how to point their finger that's and right. they think that they're leaders. I'm like, no, that's not leadership. That's just pointing your finger. Anyone can do that. You know, <laughs> anyone that has a pet dog can do that. It's not that it's that's not right. that difficult. But but being a leader is about encouraging others to be leaders, putting them in a position to be leaders, letting them make mistakes, letting them, you know, have their victories, whatever the case may be, giving them the space to grow. 
I think that's part of authentic leadership as well. Hmm. Right. Do you go True. into this into your book? I know uh, we just put it up on the screen. The book um, Lead by Example, is that what you go into in that? Is the best way to lead is to show what it is that you need in your leadership by being an example of that. What do you go into into your book, into that book? Well, you know, that I have a real holistic approach in some respects as well, Tehran, which sounds counterintuitive since we're talking business, we're talking numbers, we're talking advisory board, we're talking about my background as an investor. But I have a holistic approach and I do believe there's a tangible benefit. I mean, here we have the storytelling alchemist here um, and I love alchemy, right? Because alchemy to me is just energy work. Right. And, and what is business other than managing energy, managing people, managing the market and, and the impact you make on the market rather. And so my first chapter of the book, Tehran, is about gratitude. Okay. And, and a lot of business owners wonder why they should read a book where the first chapter is on gratitude. What does that have to do with my PL? What does that have to do with my bottom line? What does that have to do with my quarterly projections? And when people ask me that question, my answer is very simple. It has everything to do with your PL. It has everything to do with your bottom line. It has everything to do with your quarterly projections, right? Because again, going back to leadership, how many of us have ever seen a leader or a so-called leader or a boss or a CEO or a manager that day-to-day -day has zero gratitude? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how has that actually affected the turnover rate, the inability to keep a team, the inability to satisfy their clients, the inability to satisfy all of the vendors that they work with. When you have zero gratitude, it shows. Yeah. And people don't want to work for you every three you, and, and you get more and more frustrated when you go down that rabbit hole because people will start quitting and then your gratitude will stay at zero because because of the way that you think. When people give you their hard earned dollars, mm -hmm. instead of appreciating the fact, wow, thank God I have these clients, you don't you take them for granted and they can feel that energetically right when they're yeah. not getting that extra thank you when they're not getting that extra phone call when the onboarding process of a client is is very you know uh lacks proper effort people will feel that that's why it's really good vital actually not good to make sure you have a proper onboarding process for both mm -hmm. your employees as well as your clients mm -hmm. right if there's if you're not fostering a sense of community and if you're not making an extra effort to show gratitude, then, um, you, you know, someone else that understands that is going to come in and, and, and scoop them right up. I, I was a big fan of uh, Zappos. And I know recently we lost a gentleman who is the CEO of Zappos. Yeah. yeah. And, and what I appreciated about uh, the approach that that gentleman took was his emphasis on customer service hmm. and his emphasis on showing gratitude. And his emphasis on making sure that when you purchased a product from Zappos, you felt that gratitude. You didn't mm -hmm. just buy the shoe. You bought that, that sense of, wow, my money is also buying gratitude. My money is also making me feel special and acknowledged. Right. Uh, you know, I, I'm not just a number. I'm actually a human being to this company. And that's, part of, that's the reason that that company actually became so successful. Not just an aspect, but the aspect, because there are dozens and dozens of companies doing the exact same thing that they were doing, but they had a whole different approach to the onboarding process for the client and the employees, by the way, the employees loved working there too. And so, you know, th that's something big that a lot of folks don't put an emphasis on. Wow. wow that's huge. Real powerful just now. She said it's 360, you know, so energy begets energy. So you're building a team of advisors. You have a, you have your, your CEO. You have an executive team. You have supervisors, managers. You have clients. And if you can enter gratitude into that reciprocal circle, then it can grow. You know, I, I have a statement that I tend to I've said it for years, man. Once I got the science behind it, and somebody would ask me, "How am I doing?" I tend to knee jerk respond, "I'm too grateful to respond. We're too grateful to complain." And and it's really based on that same thing because you can't be grateful and complain at the same time. It's not that you don't have things to complain about, but the moment you, the time you take in that moment to complain about something, in that moment, you're not being grateful. And gratefulness begets abundance. The more you're grateful for, the more you get. So 
um, everything could always be worse. Everything could always be better, I'm sure. But a mindset, everything could always be everything could be better, but everything could also be worse. So just being too grateful to complain or having a grateful mind frame, it kind of does spill over into everything that you're connected to. So I agree with you 100 percent. I love that. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> I love. It. Well, we're on the same level. We're both loving it over here. Absolutely. Uh, we're they're sponsored by McDonald's, ladies and gentlemen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> ba -da -ba -ba -ba. There you <laughs> Just go. gotta go ahead and do it. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, we didn't get a quick break earlier, so I'm gonna run a quick break, really quick, so people can refill their coffee, run to the restroom, do whatever you gotta do. We'll be back in 60 seconds flat with Mo Rock. CEO of the Los Angeles Tribune, author of Lead by Example, with our co host Natalie Esman and Tayron Glover. Be back in just a second. A wise man once asked, what if starting a business was like jumping out of a plane? And like 76% of businesses, what if 76% of parachutes failed before you reached the destination? What about those of you who have already jumped? Well, you may still have time to check your business. Pillar5.com where businesses get it right. All right, we're not even going to hesitate. We're going to jump right back in as fast as we can so we can get as much information from Mo Rock. Um, uh, oh, if you're listening out here, please drop your comments, ask your questions. This is the time. This is the last part of the segment of the show where Mo's going to answer whatever questions you have in regards to building a board of advisories or, wh or whatever other business questions you can come up with or think of. Go ahead and shoot your questions out there and, and let our experts go ahead and provide some answers. Uh, but we don't want to stop the party. Uh, Mo, in the meantime, where could people find your book, Lead by Example? You know, the best place to, to do that is on Amazon. You can follow me on Instagram to you know see the different things that we're doing with it. The audio book is being released very shortly, and that's probably the best place to, to stay in touch. So just search me on, on Instagram and, and keep an eye out for the stories as we uh, you know unleash the different projects in the works. And is it at awesome. Mo Rock at Instagram on Instagram? Is that where you find you? Is that I think yeah, if you search that, it should come up. Mo Rock, okay. Awesome, awesome. And for for one of our lucky viewers of the show, if you go to pillar5.com and you take your assessment and you shoot over a comment during any one of the shows in the next four to six weeks and and let us know that you've taken your assessment and we can verify it. We'll throw you Mo Rock's new new book, Lead by Example, uh, paid for by I Do Systems. We'll go ahead and buy that book, and we'll make sure that you get it. And so you'll have your signed version of Mo Rock's Lead by Example. All you got to do is go over there and take your assessment at Pillar5.com. And if you don't want the book, that's okay. You still need your assessment because you still need to board a board of advisors. And somewhere down the line, you're still going to end up reading Mo's book because it's necessary for growing a sustainable business and being a qualified leader to do so. Awesome. Yeah. Damn. Now, Natalie Farris, one of my top five, one of my top five CEOs of all time, asked, why is having a book important for an expert? Mo, why is it? it does, do people need to do books? Is that something this person? I mean, like, I'm not a, I'm not particularly a author type of person, but I've written stuff. I've actually right. intended the thought of doing a book. And the more right. book, I was like, well, why wouldn't I do one? Sure. I, I'll put one together. Well, there's a very specific there's a very specific word in that question. First of all, uh, Natalie Force, very nice to meet you. Thank you for watching our program. Uh, it, it, there, there's a very specific word in that question, and that's expert, right? Mm. And so very specifically, if you want to be known as an expert in your industry, a book is a prerequisite. Now, mm. it's not a prerequisite to be a CEO. It's not a prerequisite to be a business owner. It's not a prerequisite to be an entrepreneur or a successful entrepreneur at that. But if you want to be a expert and be seen as an expert, it is a prerequisite, mm -hmm. right? And, and so very specifically, if, if part of your endeavor is to establish a personal brand where you're seen as an expert in your industry, you've got to write at least one book, if not more. And, you know, once, once upon a time, 60, 70 years ago, only experts had business cards 100 mm -hmm. years ago. If someone took out a business card and they gave it to you, 
That meant they were a lawyer, they were a doctor, they were someone that had a certain esteem in society. It wasn't something everyday uh, entrepreneurs had. You know, you, you wouldn't open up a business and have a business card 100 years ago, right? right? And so today, the same is true for a book. You know, right. in many in many ways, it's it, it's become so much e easier to write a book that a lot of people that otherwise would have never written a book can write a book, which is a good thing and a bad thing in some respects. But at the end of the day, a book is still a book, and and only three percent of professionals in the United States in high level industries have a book written. Really, three percent of professionals. And so if you think about it, if you write and publish a book, in many respects, you've just hopscotched 97% of your fellow competition, right? Oh, great insight. And yeah, so right. when you when you look at it that way, absolutely, it's very important to write a book. Right. Well, Natalie Forrest uh, uh, asked another question here uh, from Natalie Forrest International. Uh, we always thank our guests for posting their comments and questions. Um, in the Los Review, Queen her, her question here, uh, what is the best way to find the right publisher so you book amplify your message as a business owner and expert? Should all advisors, wow, that leads back into the advisory board. Should all advisors have a book? So you want to work with a publisher that can offer some marketing. What what you, you find is that there are a lot of folks that call themselves publishers, but really they're printers. Mm, right. Got you. What's the difference? Break that down. What's the difference? What do you mean? And in, in, in other words, a company may be able to give you a box full of your books or even get your book in some stores digitally or whatever the case may be. But all of the marketing is your responsibility, your job. You need to go out into the trenches. You need to do the podcasts. You need to spread awareness of your book. You need to get in the media. You need to stand up on stages and bring awareness to the book. Um, and so traditionally a publishing company would do that for you. They would print the book, they would distribute the book, and they would also market the book. But in this day and age, with all of the independent publishing houses out there, very few of them are actually offering genuine marketing and genuine branding and really helping you with that arm of it. So they, they give you the book and they're like, best of luck to you with no assistance. Gotcha. And, so, and so it's really, really important, especially for aspiring authors that are looking for different options, to ask whoever they're working with, well, what are you going to do from a marketing standpoint? What are you going to do to help me build a brand? What are you going to do to help me present this to the world? That's a very important aspect and very a very small percentage of especially the independent publishers out there offer any kind of marketing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to ask the right questions as an aspiring author. Um, and, and, and the marketing element is very important. Lots of companies can publish a nice looking book for you. Lots of companies and you know, can get you in Barnes and Nobles and Amazon. Those things are basically industry standard. But can they market the book for you? That that's the key. Mm -hmm. We got another question here from the storytelling alchemist. Um, Joe. Should Joe? <laughs> they run the other Joe. Oh no, I said show. It's a great show. He got a show. Oh, should someone self-publish or publish with a publisher? It's a great question. You know. Uh, it, it really depends uh, uh, because not every relationship between author and publisher is the same, even with the same publishing company, you know, just like go, since we're doing a lot of uh, music industry metaphors today, um, just like how a record label will focus more on, uh, on 50 cents project than they would, you know, the new aspiring rapper that doesn't have a hit. Right. Right. They're going to put more more of a push. They're going to make sure that he gets, you know, the, the big tour bus with his photo on it, whatever the case may be. And so not every relationship between author and publisher is the same. And so you've got to look at your own individual situation. If there's a publishing company that wants to work with you, but they're not offering marketing, then 100% your best bet is to do self-publish, 100%. Mm. But if they are offering marketing then there's a reason, a incentive for you to work with them. If they're helping you with the strategy, if they're helping you with the branding, but if their job is to just print the book and collect money or, or, or take an upfront fee from you, then absolutely not. You shouldn't do that. You should definitely self-publish. Hmm. Good question. Um, one other question, and this is a question that came to my mind because I was having this discussion about board of directors and, and board of advisors with some of my clients that I talked to and just some associates that I talked to as well. Um, coffee talk. 
the, the question comes up, should a person or should an entrepreneur be paying for their board of advisors? What is that relationship should be that should be there? No, because that would compromise the relationship. You know, the, mm. the, there should not be what, what happens when you start paying people on a board of advisors is you're going to uh, you, you run at risk of attracting yes men. And, and you don't want that from a board of advisors. You want people that don't have a financial incentive. That's going back to one one point that, that I'll bring back again. That's why it's important to have a cause orientated business. When you have a cause oriented business that's actively doing something to either change the status quo of an industry or doing something to actively impact the world, leave a legacy behind, you're going to naturally attract the quality of folks for your board of advisors that have an incentive that is larger than just economic. Mm. So how can you frame your business for it to be cause oriented? Because this is going to be vitally important as well to attract the caliber of people that don't care whether you pay them or not. They don't need your check, right? Right. And, and even if you start giving them a check, the relationship will change. Money always changes relationships. It's just always going to happen. And, and so, no, I, I definitely wouldn't pay a, a board of advisors because I know that it would compromise the relationship. Mm. Wow. Interesting. 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 Natalie? Nally's just soaking it all up today. <laughs> I know. I just love right. it. I do. I, this is just great stuff. And what I love about this so much is it just, to me, it's, it should be common sense, right? It's that group of people that you have the same value systems as, that you're moving towards something together with, that you can count on. And I say this all the time in business. None of us are perfect, right? Balls are going to get dropped. But can I trust you? Are the right intentions there? Are we going towards the same thing? And I think that's most important. So when I think of that advisory, those are that's that group of people. It's mm -hmm. right. Um, if I drop the ball, do you have my back? Can I count on you? Can I delegate? Are these things going to be right? Do I have to harass you to follow through? Are you always going to give me an excuse? Because then I know right away, OK, this has to be a tough conversation, probably not the person to be on my advisory board anymore. Right. And you have to have that conversation. But Mo, one thing that I, I do wonder about is I was looking up um, diversity among advisory boards. What are your thoughts on that? I just know being a woman in finance, there's not a lot of us that tend to be in those circles. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know we have to talk a lot about separating church and state. Mm -hmm. I think uh, women might be a little bit more emotion, more emotional oriented in the boardroom than men. So right. what are your thoughts on that? I well, you know, it's interesting. It, it's interesting, Natalie. I'm a very, you know, unconventional person in that respect. I operate from a level where I don't see gender or race unless you bring it up. But that's just how I approach my day to day life. Right. And, and so my my hope is that we as a species can get to that place where it's not even something that matters one way or the other. Right. So unless it's brought up, I don't see race, I don't see religion, I don't see gender. I see human beings, I see character, I see um, you know attributes about what kind of a human being you are, right? So that's number one. But so unless it's brought up, I don't even see that, uh, right? So it's very foreign. This idea is very foreign to me about how that even makes a difference for people. I don't get it. I really don't. Um, <laughs> but with that being said. Uh, knowing that it's a part of day to day, uh, I, I think the answer is to encourage a new way of thinking, a new kind of leadership, a new approach, which is what I do. Because naturally, uh, when you introduce a new way of thinking, a new kind of leadership, a holistic approach, these problems will fade away. Uh, you can put a Band-Aid on it, mm. right? And you can tell, you you know, you can make some regulations or whatever the case may be. But if you're not addressing the core, a Band-Aid, every generation, you're just going to need another Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. This generation, we put a Band-Aid on it. Next generation, we'll put a Band-Aid on it. Yeah. The, the three generations from now, people will be yelling and screaming for another Band-Aid. Four generations from now, they'll be yelling and screaming for another Band-Aid. So that, to me, is a dumb approach to just keep throwing Band-Aids on things. Right. Let's address the core problem. What's the core problem? The way of thinking that we have as a society and as a species. That's mm -hmm. why part of my mission on this planet is to introduce a new way of thinking, a new kind of leadership, because 
we well, could put band-aids on it and nothing will change. And so, you know, the, the answer is, uh, and I know I'm taking a, a, a dive now in the rabbit hole here in the last <laughs> few minutes, but the answer is to introduce a new kind of leadership to the planet because the kind of leadership of the past has simply not been, been working. So that's how I look at it, Natalie. You know, I, I don't, I, I have no interest in throwing another bandaid on things and getting, um, you know, getting a couple points and looking good in front of the camera and saying, oh, let's put a bandaid on it. I think that's a bunch of crap. I, I, I don't think that addresses the problem, which is the way of thinking that we have as a society, as a species. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very interesting. It goes back to your book, uh, Lead by Example. You know, I've also heard it said you can't change. Well, what is it? A person whose mind is changed against their will is of the same opinion still. So if we want was to that change, Was that Curtis Jackson? No. <laughs> 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 you like 50 Cent, huh? <laughs> like this guy, Curtis Jackson, right? exactly big fan. But I guess it goes back to being by example, like being the change you want to see. And how you, you can impact it. You right. Do yeah. <laughs> that you might know, have been, was that Ralph Waldo Emerson? Who said that? Do you know? I don't. I can't recall. That's powerful. Yeah. person whose Very mind changed against their will is of the same opinion still, which is where you get buyer's remorse from. You can sell somebody to agree with you, but afterwards, they're like, what did I just do? I don't really feel like that. So, right. Stop selling, service, provide, change the world intentionally. Be the change, as Gandhi said, you want to be, and right. your vibe will attract your tribe, Jack. <laughs> right, Absolutely. I love that. Awesome, Natalie. All right, Mo. Thanks for for being with us, um, publisher, CEO of the LA Tribune, talking to us about boardroom benefits this morning. You brought us so much wisdom, really, Mo, this morning, and we're so grateful. Hopefully that. Um, People were able to get some of those nuggets that you brought today. At least go back and watch the, the replay. Thank you so much for just what you contribute, contribute, how hard you work, and for joining us this morning. We're, we're super grateful to have you here. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Thank you guys for all the good work. It's a privilege and pleasure for us to stand side by side with you guys. And the best is yet to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's get to hey, so make sure you guys go out there and get Mo's book, um, Lead by Example. And you can look him up on Instagram. On LinkedIn, just look up Mo Rock. I trust me, when you plug in Mo Rock, there's only going to be one that pops up that looks That's like this. Right. One. So, <laughs> <laughs> only one Mo Rock. <laughs> there's only one row. Thank you, Mo. We woke you up early, but uh, Thanks, enjoy Mo. your coffee. Have a great day, brother. <laughs> Love you guys, bro. Love you guys. Thank Appreciate you, you guys. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Mo. Bye. Yeah, Mo was awesome. He's pretty. Dumb. Yes. Wow, you Talk know, I always that. get a smile after talking to Mo. It's just like crazy. He just gets it. He understands. And so that's awesome to have that insight. I thought that would. So so I know we're down to like 60 seconds before we run off. So really quick before we jump off the show. Um, if you haven't taken your Pillar 5 assessment, please go do so. So you can identify where your business is and know what the next steps are to get your business to the next level. Right now, you can get on Pillar 5 and you have one day access absolutely free, no credit card required. And if you do your assessment, we'll bring you on the show so that you can introduce your business to all of our viewers and the audience. You'll get to talk to people like Mo Rock and other experts who join us like Sharon Lecter, Patty Farmer, Amy Razor, and the, and more and more Call it Portis and more and more and more. Um, Take away from the show for me, and then I want everybody to answer, and then we can jump off, is don't pay the advisors because it taints the water of the relationship. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. That That's my takeaway for today's show. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. I don't know. My takeaway from um, advisors, um, you, you just got to have one. Not to have one is just, you know, to shoot yourself in the foot, really. I don't remember the quote he said, but I said enough quotables, I guess, throughout this show. So <laughs> you know, expand your horizon with experts and vet them and make sure they want the mission to be completed. You know, build yourself with your team. That's right. Ask, ask the right questions because our advisory team is is everything if we're looking to do this long term and for purpose driven. So mine was if you consider yourself an expert, a book is a prereq. Mm. Mm. So, Good one. I'm excited. That to have sounds a book. like all of us need to start writing books. Is there, it's time to go write a book. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Well, thank you all for joining us today. It was great. Yeah, I was just saying everybody's an expert at something. So everybody got a book in them. Everybody got a book in them. That's right. That's right. Well, again, you're watching the Better Your Business Show with Natalie Esmond, your financial expert, and Tayron Glover and Carlton Hoskins here on uh, the Better Your Business Show. Join us live every Monday. Don't forget to miss, don't forget, do not miss the Los Angeles Tribune live. 
that happens every Monday night. You can go on there and join that live. They have great content. Mo Rock leads that along with Natalie Forrest. Um, great content there. So don't miss out on that. Go take your assessment. In between then and now, we wish you much success. Grow a sustainable, successful business. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. Our goal is simple, to help you achieve the dream and vision you first had when you thought about starting a business. We're here to make growing your business less complicated. There are building blocks to build a sustainable business. We promise to seek them out and address them all. The Better Your Business Show starts now. A wise man once asked, what if starting a business was like jumping out of a plane? And like 76% of businesses, what if 76% of parachutes failed before you reached the destination? What about those of you who have already jumped? Well, you may still have time to check your business. Pillar5.com, where businesses get it right.